Oh look, Santa Claus dropped off some electrical equipment. Wonder Twin powers activate. So you've closed on your land, you're excited. The first thing you do is you go and you visit your property. You walk it, walk the property lines, check it all out. You envision what it could be and what you're going to do with it. It's super exciting and I know I've been there. And the next thought that probably goes through your head is what it's going to take to put an RV on your property. So you can actually be on site and kind of live there while you build your house or you know, build a dream home or some RV pads or whatnot. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to um, clear the land because it's probably wooded. You're going to have to clear the land to make room to get your RV in and out. Yeah, you can use some, some logging paths maybe, but in my case, they just weren't, you know, wide enough, tall enough or whatever. So, you know, you have to clear some land. And then, you know, of course the, you know, the thing that goes along with clearing the land is some sort of a driveway. The last thing you want to do is, you know, enter your property, stay overnight in your RV or camping unit, and then get rain in the middle of the night causing you to be stuck on your property, you know, stuck in, you know, six inches of mud and not be able to get out. So, although it's not required, I highly recommend, you know, building some sort of a, a driveway surface that's, you know, that's going to withstand, you know, rainstorms and not wash out and allow you to get off the property. So those are kind of your first two objectives is after you get through the emotional part of closing on your land is building a driveway after you're cleared. And, and you know, hopefully you watch some of our other videos on clearing the land we've did a we did a whole bunch of uh, videos on that i've i'll put them down below in the description and then they're also you know up above here with um um you know some links that you can click on you know recommend you check those out as well hi this is comet troy coming to you from linden camp 35 acres i bought southeast of linden tennessee about five minutes i'm in the process of turning that 35 acres into a small boutique RV park. So this video is exciting because we're going to finally turn the page from the chapter on land clearing and dirt work to more of uh, infrastructure, you know, specifically bringing electricity into the property in this video. Other things for um, infrastructure that we'll be bringing in and, and I'll talk about them in other videos is, is uh, water and sewer and fiber, internet and communications and all that fun stuff. You can look down in the description. I might have already produced those by the time you're watching those. So uh, check to see if they're down there. If they're not down there, I either haven't updated the description yet or the videos just haven't been produced yet. So as I said earlier, you know, the third thing you wanna do after you clear the land and build a driveway is get some sort of power on your property. Now it's not necessarily required that you get power. I lived off of solar panels um, on the property and generator in April, so that worked uh, fairly well and if you're in a temperate climate or a mild climate that could work well for you as well but we're not talking about solar panels in this video we're going to be talking about the quickest fastest cheapest way to get power on your property to power your rv but first a little disclaimer i am not an electrician and i don't work for the utility company this is, electricity is somewhat in my lane though. I do have a two year associate degree in electrical engineering. So I know my way around, you know, Ohm's law and the uh, resistor color code, how transistors work and flip flops and transformers and all that. So I, you know, I do speak from, from some, some knowledge and experience in that area. So uh, despite what I what I give you, I'm not an electrician, like I said. So I highly recommend that um, you hire an electrician for this process. Now, the state of Tennessee does allow um, lot owners to do their own uh, work. So you know, all this work can be done by you without an electrician if you want to. The state of Tennessee requires an electrical permit for all electrical work, and they will come in and inspect it before the power company will energize it. You know, they're not going to let you screw up too bad if you do it yourself. But, you know, if you don't, if you feel in, you're in over your head and even if, you know, even if you don't, I highly recommend um, hiring an electrician or at least, you know, working with one. Uh, maybe you'll find one that, you know, allows you to do certain parts yourself and, you know, they'll oversee it. 
you know, it's just really up to the electrician of, you know, what they're willing to do. You know, I, I'm not going to be responsible for anybody getting electrocuted so or shocked. The other inspection that's required is from um, the electric company, but that only applies to if you run underground wire. They want to come in and inspect the trenches and inspect the conduit that's run for their wire. But for this type of uh, overhead service here, overhead service you see behind me here, for a meter pole, it's called, it's officially called a meter pole, and uh, an RV temporary power panel, you know, down below here, um, that inspection is not required because there's no underground. And then the other inspection in this, you know, in the state of Tennessee is a septic inspection which we're not talking about today either. So no underground, no septic. We're just talking about um, overhead wire to a meter pole and then a temporary power disconnect for an RV. So today's video is gonna be divided up into, I guess, four chapters, if you call them, or sections. Um, the first section that we're gonna go through is talking about some terms and definitions just talking about you know some of the things that are used by the electric company and um, electricians in general. So you can you know walk the walk and talk the talk, or at least talk the talk. And then I'm going to um, bring in uh, Hef, the IT guy, and show you on the computer some online resources you can get to to help you with this project. I'm not going to explain every technical detail because a lot of that is is on you know the electric company's. Um, utility and you know if you're not in you know this area Perry County Tennessee then your electric company may have a similar something and then um, next we're going to actually take you through um, the videos of the actual installation here at Linden Camp of this meter and temporary RV socket that was installed back in uh, June started in in earlier this year. I'm going to take you through a timeline of that. And then lastly, we're going to have a celebratory transfer of power. Not political power. We don't talk about political stuff on my channel. Oops. So we're going to talk about transfer of power from, from generator power off the grid to utility power on the grid. So Buckle up your seatbelts and stay tuned for some informative videos, hopefully. Okay, let's talk about terms and definitions. Let's talk about polls. No, I'm not talking about election polls. Again, we don't talk about politics on this channel. Well, I'm talking about polls regarding um, electricity. So there's actually uh, four different uh, types of, of polls we're gonna be talking about today. The first common poll that, you know, probably all of you know about is the, you know, the standard uh, primary distribution line polls or utility polls. They're the, the polls that you see along the roadside, you know, that where all the wires run on them, those wires are called uh, primary distribution lines and um, anything that's over 600 volts is considered primary distribution line because it connects to the primary side of the transformer. And ours here are 14,000 volts. So that's the first kind of pole is a, is a utility pole. Um, the second type of pole that we're gonna talk about is a meter pole. And that's what we have over here at, uh, at Linden Camp is a meter pole. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. A uh, third type of, of pole that you can get is called a, a temporary pole. So, the, no, not, not here. I'll show a picture of the temporary pole. A temporary pole is meant to be temporary. Coming in, you know, let's say you're building a house and you just need some temporary power there to run air compressors and power tools. What you would do is, you know, put in a a temporary power pole like we have here and then once the house is constructed then you know the power would swing over to the house and then the last type of pole is what's called a uh, a slack span pole and this is a um, the, the best way I can describe a slack span pole is like a giant electric company extension cord deeper into your property 
So an RV pole, like you see here, or a meter pole, can only be, oh, I don't know, maybe like 200 feet. I, I don't have the distance right, and every utility company may vary a little bit, but it's somewhere between, um, I don't know, 100, it's at least 200, I believe, could be up to 300 feet, you know, from, from the transformer, which is, you know, back on the street there. So what do, you, what do you do if you need to go deeper into your property? What if you want to install this, you know, this temporary pole, say 600 feet in your property? Well, that's, that's too far away from the transformer at the road to do it efficiently. So what you do is you use what's called a slack span pole. And think of the slack span pole as a giant extension cord from the utility company. What they do is they'll, they'll put another another you know big utility pole deeper into your property and they'll run the primary wires from the road you know deeper into the property and then the transformer will go back 300 feet on that slack span pole instead of at the road and then from the slack span pole they'll run to the the meter pole 600 feet back so we're not going to talk too much about a slack span pole um, the word on the street around here in linden is a slack span pole can will get you 300 feet of distance off the road and um, they're about $2,000. So, you know, if you want one of them giant extension cords from the local utility company, at least here in, in uh, you know, Perry County, Tennessee, they're about $2,000. Now that price will vary up and down based upon how far, if you only gotta go 100 or 200 feet, then I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, I don't really know for a fact that, you know, it would be less expensive than the, than the 2000. And then of course, you know, with the slack span, that's where the right of way, way clearing comes in. You know, and if you watch my um, seven ways to clear land, you know, linked up here above in the, in the video and down below in the description, I talk about electric company right of way clearing where you have to clear 20 feet on each side of the electric line that's where that comes into play is for a slack span pole where you're running the primary wire you know from the street overhead to another utility pole deep in your property and you can stack these poles so let's say you got to go you know 900 feet or 1000 feet you know you can put several of these slack span poles together you know to make the the quote unquote utility company extension cord longer and longer i mean you can you i mean it's high voltage wire, which is great for transmission electricity. It's, you know, over 14,000 volts here from what I've heard. And, you know, you can literally go miles with, um, you know, with, uh, you know, the high voltage power without having, you know, much loss in, uh, in transmission capability. There's a utility pole at the road back there, somewhere along there. And then that, that comes in into the Veterans Park here and connects up to this pole here. So that's primary wire coming in from the road. And then you can see there's a transformer hanging off of this slack span pole. And from this transformer, it connects uh, several services to the building in front of me and uh, to some other, it looks like there's a, a couple disconnects um, down there um, for the ball diamond lights. So that all uh, feeds off of this slack span. And then there's uh, you know, a building here behind me that actually gets service from that slack span as well. So that's what a slack span is. So those are the four type of poles. We're gonna focus primarily on the, um, the meter pole, the RV pole here behind me. But I just wanted to get the poles out of the way first as our first definition. If you have any, if you have any questions or comments on that, you know, let me know down below. Okay, the next word I want to talk about is the word temporary. I was really confused when I started um, bringing or talking about bringing electricity on this property and the word temporary was used. I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't want a temporary service. I, I want this pole to stay here. I want a permanent, a permanent service. You know, I don't want you to come and take it away from me six months from now. But, but here's where the confusion. There's a temporary pole, which is one kind of temporary. And then this here is called a temporary power 
distribution panel. So the temporary pole is what you would bring in, you know, while you're constructing the house. And then, you know, when the house is done, they take it away. And what you have here is a, a permanent RV pole with a temporary power panel on it. So that's how I got confused. Temporary power just means that you're gonna pull an RV up to it and, you know, plug your RV in and that's temporary power. You know, the alternative to temporary power, of course, is, you know, building a house and hooking the wires directly up to the house and, you know, having, you know, that's, that's more permanent power to a, a structure as opposed to a, a temporary, you know, power here. So I have a permanent meter pole. The meter poles are permanent as opposed to, you know, a temporary power pole. And then I have a temporary, uh, you know, plug-in for my RV. So we talked about poles. We talked about um, distribution panels or breaker boxes, a lot of people call them. And the next thing we're gonna talk about is wires and transformers. We could get really deep into this, but I'm just going to um, kind of explain the three different types of, of uh, wire installations. We've already talked about the primary distribution lines, which you know are up on the poles along the road, or if you're bringing you know, a slack span, poles into your property that's that's all primary wire and that's because it connects to the primary side of the transformer the high voltage the 14,000 volts on the other side of the transformer is your your 240 volts that goes to your meter that's what's called your secondary distribution line and that will go to um, from from your transformer whether it be a pole based transformer or a ground based transformer and so primary wire comes at the road here in this installation, which is right over there, it goes to a transformer. The transformer steps it down to 240. It goes across the transmission lines, down my pole to the meter. So the wire that goes from the meter over to the pole back over there is called a secondary distribution line. It's less than 600 volts, mine are 240. Goes to the meter base, disconnect, meter base, disconnect, the 200 amp breaker, and then there's a 100 amp breaker that goes down to my temporary distribution panel where my RV sockets are. Now, the wire that goes from the distribution panel with the breakers, the 100 amp breaker that goes down to here is what I, it's what I call your, your circuits. I, I'm not sure if there's a technical name for it. Your, your branch circuits, they hook up to a breaker. so. You know, of course, mine are all like, you know, right here. So the branch circuit wire is only, a, you know, a foot or two long. But you could actually run, you know, a branch circuit underground and go, you know, 100 feet away to a, an RV power pedestal, you know, down the way. But again, this video is about fast, cheap and easy. So that's the fast, cheap and easy way is to have everything mounted on your RV or on your meter pole, you know, base disconnect and break on um, plugins. So who pays for all this? That's the next thing that I'm going to define. Well, let me tell you, the, the member owner does. That's what we have here. They're called member owners. They're not, we're not called customers. We actually uh, sign a membership agreement with the local utility. So technically I own, I'm part owner in the local utility. I have voting rights. They send out a proxy and an annual whatever every year to vote on things. But, you know, I don't really have any decision making or control over the, the public utility. So the member customer or the member owner is the one who pays for everything. With the exception of the primary distribution wires that run down, you know, run down the road. You know, that of, of course is picked up um, you know, by the local utility company, by infrastructure grants at the federal level, state level, you know, from the developer who wants to bring, you know, power in. But it's not, it's not the landowner, so that's what we really care about here. You know, we don't have to pay for the wires that go down the street. But after that, everything is the responsibility of the, of the uh, member owner, you know, the lot owners. Now there is a, um, a rebate that's given for each meter that gets set. So I have a meter here 
At this time of recording this, it's $1,500 per meter. The electric company or the state or the feds or someone kicks in $1,500 to do some of the build out. You know, in my case, because I'm so close to the road, that basically covered the wire from the road, the transformer, and then, you know, down this pole. So all I really had to pay the electric company was to just, you know, bring me out a pole and set it, which was, you know, less than $300, you know, super, super cost effective. Of course, you could set your own pole and, you know, dig your hole, but, you know, why would you? I own the pole and everything that's connected to it. In fact, you know, I would own everything on the property except for anything that's part of the primary distribution network or the primary line distribution. You know, so if you run a slack span pole or if you run underground primary, you know, that is, that is owned by the electric company and the electric company requires an easement to maintain that, that property, you know, that, those property. And you're also responsible, you know, as a, as a landowner to protect it. You know, if you drive your, you drive your truck over a transformer and hit a pole, you know, that's on you to fix it. And the electric company is going to probably make you do that. So that pretty much covers the terms and definitions. So next we're going to, I'm going to go see if I can find half and get on the computer and, and show you where to find some resources, you know, to make all this happen. Hi, this is Hef the IT Guy, and Comet Troy asked me to show you some online resources on how to uh, procure power from Marywell Lewis here in Perry County. So I'm going to uh, quickly show that here. I have um, my browser up on the internet, and I'm just going to go up here and type in mlec.com, and that will bring up the Marywell Weather Lewis website. And the part that we're interested in here is the tab that says get electric service. Now you can actually find this in four different spots on the website. Up here at the top right, there's a get electric service and then they have it down here in the main bar. And then get electric service start here. And if you click on the menu, that's the fourth place. So it doesn't really matter which one you, you, you click on. That's how you get into the important parts here that I wanted to show you. So I'm just gonna click on this one here and the first page that comes up kind of gives you some guidelines of um, that inspections are required. You need to have the MLEC engineer come out and do a site survey, uh, put some stakes in the ground where transformers and poles and all that sort of stuff is going to go. And just the high level, you know, this is how you engage us. Um, you know, uh, uh, not really rules, but, you know, guidelines and that. And then the, the part that I really like here on this website is the, on the right, there's a button called service specs. And this is actually all the handouts. So when the engineer comes out on site and meets you for the first time, before he leaves, he'll, he'll hand you um, one of these printouts of, you know, what you're going to be putting in. In this case, in this video, we're talking about um, an overhead um, service to a recreational vehicle or recreational meter or a recreational vehicle. It's right here, this uh, fourth one down on the left. If you click it, it actually has some pretty detailed specifications of, of how to actually construct the RV pole. Now, the, the electric company will come out and they'll actually set the pole on the ground and then it's the customer or the um, the member owner's responsibility to hire an electrician and bolt everything to the pole. It, you know, shows you where to put the straps. You know, here's the meter disconnect here in the middle or the meter, the meter base. And then this would be the main disconnect and uh, breaker box in this illustration. And then below this is the RV plug. It talks about, you know, grounding rods and, you know, distances. The meter base has to be five and a half feet from the ground. And, you know, it gives you some, you know, some pretty good specs if you want to do this yourself. It even tells you what type of wire you need for a 200 amp service, a 100 amp, and a 60 amp service. Now here at Linden Camp, for our recreational pole, or our meter pole as they call it, we did 200 amp service. And you'll see later in the video that 
um, we are actually ran the four aught aluminum, you know, which is listed right here according to the spec. So very helpful information. There are some other um, type of service specs here. I'm not going to go through those or click on them, but you can you can uh, go through here on your leisure and do that. Now, if you're not with Marywell Lewis, you know, your electric company in your area probably has something similar and you'll have to look for it. I can't, you know, show everyone's electric power. So this is this is the service that's in Perry County and is divided up into overhead service and underground service. So I hope this helps you. And uh, back to Comet Troy. All right, all right. I hope that was helpful information from uh, Hef, the IT guy. So let's get into the actual construction of this pole behind me. I recorded quite a bit of it. Um, it's end of October while I'm recording this video, so I'm going to take you back through some of the old videos that um, you know we we took since you know to to make this all happen. So let's get right into those. So this all started in, in January of this year. I hadn't cleared the land yet. I had just closed on it in December and I made an appointment with the electric company. They came out and I had a meeting with the engineer. I didn't really know what I was doing and it was maybe kind of a waste of the engineer's time. It was good for me because it was kind of a meet and greet. I got to meet the engineer and we got to you know, just jaw jack a little bit and talk about what the plans were and, you know, get some of the ideas. But I didn't really know enough at that point to, you know, to to do any cost sheets or, you know, get anything really going. Um, the advice that was given to me at that time was, you know, get an electrician involved and clear the land and then, you know, have me back out and we'll figure it all out then. So now we're in February. There was no poles on the road, no right of way clearing. We didn't even have power at the street yet. So February, the, the uh, Tennessee Land and Lakes, the developer here, uh, worked on clearing right away. So they had to take a lot of trees out of the ditches and clear that, you know, that, that 20 feet, you know, on the, you know, on each side of the, the, pro the primary distribution lines before the utility company would come out and install their poles. Of course, Tennessee Land and Lakes had to actually issue a check, you know, to the electric company before they would actually um, put the poles in. So that, that work pretty much happened in February. In March, they, uh, the electric company came out, the right of way was cleared, and they um, drilled holes for all the poles along McGee Road here and put the um, the power poles in, or the electric, uh, electric, um, the primary line distribution poles. Those were all set in the ground, and I had a, a pretty little pole here on my property. There were no wires run to it. There was no guy wires, no nothing. It's just they just went along here and, you know, put the poles in the ground in in March. And then we get to April. I came on site, had the land cleared, and I made an appointment with uh, the engineer. I'm like, hey, I got the land cleared. I'm ready for some electricity now. Found out that he was three weeks out, so that appointment was scheduled for the first part of May. Um, in the meantime, I'm clearing the land, and the electric company came back out and and actually, um, you know, put the put the guy wire on my pole, which I have some video of here. And uh, shortly after that, they, they ran the wires down, uh, down the street on those, on those the, the primary line, you know, distribution, or the primary distribution lines, or wires, primary they call them, were run along those poles. And we actually had um, the first, you know, this or the second step, poles and then wires. And then when they get all done with that, then they actually connect them up to the, the main grid and we have power on the road. So they didn't actually connect up um, the wires on our road until we had a customer. And there's uh, three of us that have power now. I think uh, my neighbor across the street was the first one. And then the Wendland's over there. Uh, actually, I was the second one. 
because the Wendlands uh, did some trenching underground and it took theirs a little bit while. So I was the second customer and then the Wendlands were the third ones to get on, to get on those wires. So now it's May. Uh, May 3rd, I had my appointment with the electric company. They came out and again, we looked at the overall design of the project, you know, did a little bit of uh, jaw jacking or whatnot. And then um, we finally came up to where the um, RV pole is going to be set. And I got that, uh, I got a stake put into the ground to where that was going to go. And that was pretty exciting. My engineer from the electric company then uh, you know, measured the distance, went back to his office and filled out what's called a cost sheet. So before you can sign up for electric service, you need to have the engineer fill out a cost sheet. The cost sheet is what's given to the front office at the utility company that tells you how much to pay. So um, that's what happened. And, you know, I made a couple of videos here uh, after the electrician left. So here's McGee Road. There's the electric pole, the power pole that the electric company put in. And then right down over here is where we're going to put a, an RV pole with power. It's kind of close to the road, but for a temporary basis, I think it will be workable. And, you know, we even said, I was talking to the uh, uh, MLEC guy, and he said, well, you know, you could actually, you know, park up there off the road and just run an extension cord over to the RV pole. So that's what we decided we're gonna do. Here we are close to the RV pole that I'm gonna have put in like ASAP so I can stop burning through all kinds of diesel fuel. It's by the road, but it's close to the electric pole. So here's where the RV pole is going to go. And I'll just swing around slowly here so you can see you know, how close we are to the road and then soon the there's the electric pole so we're going to run service from the electric pole behind me over to the rv pole over here let's see there coming in coming in there it is and then i'll be able to park my rv here and have power i'm also going to have a water tap put in near the pole so i'll be able to run water to the rv just have to figure out how to get rid of the black and gray tanks. Hopefully the septic system will be coming soon for that. I don't want to get hollered at. Then I went into MLEC to um, pay for the, the cost sheet and sign up for service and sign my membership agreement. And then I left for Gulf Shores for a wedding down there. There's Comet Troy on vacation at a beachside wedding. About to happen. A couple of my friends getting married down here in Gulf Shores, Alabama. And then when I came back from Gulf Shores to pick up the RV, I got to the property and my pole had already been set with the wires across. Of course, not, nothing was hooked up, but you know, the, the stuff was delivered within, you know, within a week while I was down in Gulf Shores. So I was pretty, pretty happy about that. All right, we're getting the next step of the RV power pole installed. We got our service wire run across and we got a meter socket being installed. And the riser for the 200 amp service. We're hoping to have it, today's Saturday, we're hoping to maybe have it inspected on Tuesday and energized on Thursday. What size are those wires? Four alt. Is that a, they're, they look like they're aluminum, huh? They are, yeah. Okay. A little cheaper than copper. A whole lot cheaper than copper. Yeah. That's right, it's four alt. So there's the RV sockets a 50, a 30, and a 20 GFCI. <laughs> Got 200 amp mains, 4 watt aluminum feeding those.
Hey, we are one step closer to having electricity over here at Linden Camp. Just waiting for the electric company to come and plug the meter in and hook up the wires. There's my uh, 200 amp circuit breaker main coming in at the top. 100 amp uh, branch circuit going down below to my temporary RV pole with a 50, a 30, and a 20 amp with the breakers in it. I got some extra capacity there for some extra breakers and some extra capacity there for some extra breakers. Just waiting for the electric company to come in and and uh, hook up the wires up there and plug the meter in. And then I'll, I'll be good to go. I just want to talk about my favorite temporary power panel. You see it right here. It's got uh, options for 50 amp, 30 amp, and a GFCI 20 amp. And the thing I really like about this, this panel is it's got a breaker for each of the things below, but then it's also got a whole uh, four more slots that you can put some more breakers in. So a lot of the other temporary panels don't have that, uh, that luxury. So you could, you know, you could hook up a, you know, a yard light into here or, you know, another, another 50 amp because this is a 125 amp panel. So, you know, you could, uh, you know, you have lots of options with this and it uses the big breakers too. So the ones that are compatible with Siemens and um, they're, they're work, they work for me really well. And if you're interested in this, I buy these on Amazon. I actually have a link below in the description of, uh, you know, how you can get your hands on these panels. At the time of filming, they go for uh, $212.80 US, which, you know, is a really good price as far as I'm concerned. So uh, go on down there and uh, click on that link and get you some. So not too many though. I need, I'm going to need some more. Well, look at that. That's a beautiful sight. It's 1045 on June 15th, Wednesday, and I have a power connection. The service wires are connected up, and looky here, I even have a meter. Let's see what it says. Oh, it's already got numbers on it. I thought maybe it would say zero when it started, but no, that's not the case. Look at that. We now have power. Just got to move the RV up here. Now look at that. We got a meter and we got power now. Well, I haven't tested it, so can't say for 100% sure that I have power yet. But I'm guessing if I plug my RV in there, I'll have power. So now I just got to move it from down there to down here. Well, Penelope, are we ready? Listen to the sound. Quiet. You're pretty hot. What in the hell is this? I never seen anything like this before. Not in this land anyway. Oh look, Santa Claus dropped off some electrical equipment. Wonder Twin powers activate in the form of a 200 amp breaker. Wonder Twin powers activate in the form of a 100 amp breaker. And finally, in the form of a 50 amp breaker. And listen for the click. And there we are, consuming power. the power coming online for the first time. Yay! Well, I was expecting to see the thing really whipping around here. It's almost 100 degrees here in Tennessee and both ACs are running full blast, but it's not uh, spinning by as fast as I thought it was going to be, which is cool, I guess. 